Welcome to AI Australia, brought to you by Eliza. On this show, your hosts James Wilson and Nigel Dalton have in-depth conversations with technology leaders, academics and AI professionals about all things artificial intelligence. We'll explore a broad range of topics, including AI strategy, technology and ethics, providing valuable insights for Australian businesses at all stages of AI adoption. And now, your hosts, James and Nigel. Good day, everybody. Welcome back to AI Australia. We're your hosts, James Wilson and Nigel Dalton. Nigel, how are you going today? I started the day attempting to explain Moravec's paradox to real estate agents. So I think our guest today may be able to help me out, giving me a slightly better and more simplified version of how that darn thing works with the sort of background and resume our guest has. Wow. I know. We are very lucky to be joined by Kendra Vant today. So Kendra is one of Australia's leaders in data analytics. Uh, She holds a PhD in physics from MIT and has a wealth of experience across insurance, banking, telco, government, gaming, the airline industry, and is currently um, principal data scientist at Seek. Um, Kendra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. What does a principal data scientist do? Yeah, that's a reasonable question that I ask myself occasionally. (laughs) Um, So look, I joined Seek a couple of years ago, and that was a new role for us at the time. So it was a bit of come in and carve out your space, which was great. Essentially, it means for us trying to figure out what of Seek's products can be enhanced by a machine learning algorithm inside that will actually be able to say, say for instance, um, you're on Seek's site, you search for a job, You find a job that we say, yep, this one might match for you. But you think, ah, should I apply for that? You know, will I get the job? It's a lot of effort to put into the job. We're going to try and build an algorithm that says, hey, you should. You'd be a great match for this job. Our data shows us that you are. So it's that kind of thing. It's out of the possible, what could we do with our data, right through to out of the practical, how do we get this to work at scale for millions of customers around Australia. Do you do any of the basic housekeeping stuff? Because I think my favourite thing about jobs is the 19 million ways people describe the same job and it sort of seems to cry out for a bit of natural language processing and is a is a, partic- a, a, t- a business analyst the same as a technical business analyst? And that, those are constructs that we've created in our heads that I think very difficult to do if you were going back to create a Boolean search for the exact right job. You you know, think of all the jobs on Seek that have had Agile in the job description or the title in recent times. Is that a field that you've been interested in? Yeah, so for sure. So there's a, Seek's been done that for a long time. Technically, that, that tends to sit more with our ontology team. So just trying to really say, gosh, project manager, that means something very different if you're in IT or if you're in construction. So the, that level of how can we pull it together to make sure that you... Nigel searching on the site, find project management that is relevant to you is mostly in our IR, and I don't work in that area. What I'm more interested in doing is saying, if we take all the rest of the context in a sentence, can we figure out from that context, oh, that this Java developer means this, whereas over here Java means I make good coffee. Mm. So yeah, we get a lot into that, and it's one of the reasons that made me really excited about joining Seek, is we have enormous amounts of natural language, way more than most other companies do. And of course, we have it not just in English, but in about 18 other languages around the world. And what sort of results have you been getting? Have people been searching more because they feel more comfortable with it? Are they getting more results back for their efforts? So for us, what we're really focused on is how easily someone can find what they want. So just searching more could actually be an indication that our search is broken. So what we're more interested in is how much, how often will they click through to a role that they find in their search, which would indicate to us that they like that idea, that they, we found something that was good for them, and then how often will they go on to apply for that role, which right. says that when they read the job description, they thought, hey, yeah, that's me, and they actually went on to apply. So click through and application rate is what we're really focused on. So, for, I mean, that's a business that's spent 20 years plus doing search. Sounds like you're moving to match rather than search. We do both, absolutely. So we... So from the way I tend to think about it is search is what you are actually definitely looking for and match is what you might serendipitously realise is actually a really good fit for you based on what we know about you. So prior to Seek, you had a pretty amazing kind of career. Um, interested to hear a little bit more about kind of how your career's unfolded and, and, you know, how you got to this kind of point. I was going to say, are you mentioning I appear to have a very short attention span and hence move on a lot? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have moved around a lot. So as I like to reflect sometimes, 
particularly when I'm talking to my teenagers about what they might like to do, data science didn't exist as a career back when I was at school. And I think a lot of my colleagues, that's also true. Um, so I started out in physics, and that's where all my academic training is. Um, I genuinely thought that that's what I wanted to do, which is why I went on to do my doctorate. And I certainly wouldn't have done that if I hadn't needed to leave because it was a hard slog. Um, spent six really interesting years at MIT, which is a real pressure cooker of a university. Um, I played with firing lasers at very, very cold atoms, which was a lot of fun. And the practical application, because everyone always asks, is there one? Yes, there is one. It's very high precision frequency measurement, which is how you push massive amounts of information down fiber optic cables. So you know, it was a practical application. It was also a lot of fun. Um, after a while, I just realized that although I loved being a doctoral student and I loved playing in the lab, I didn't want to go on to the next stage of being an academic, which is grant writing. Mm. And I was also a bit spoiled. I'd been seven years in the States and I didn't want to come back. I did want to come back to New Zealand because I love New Zealand, but I didn't want to come back to um, a New Zealand university with the budget constraints that that involves because the research I did was very expensive. Um, so I branched out and that was a really scary experience because um, as I think we all face with that first big move, you, you don't know what your transferable skills are. I would have to say I was serendipitously lucky to come across a recruiter who looked at me and went, oh, yeah, I can slot you in somewhere. And I went into software development, which serendipitously looking back was incredibly helpful because at a time when a lot of my colleagues from MIT were going to become quants on Wall Street, it was just starting to tip. And about two years after I graduated, almost all of my colleagues went to Google. And so it was just that time when it was taking off that whole idea of, hey, you can take all these quantitative skills and you can apply them to all of these new areas that are, are, being, are emerging. And software engineering is the perfect complement to analytical mathematical skill. Complete accident. I did not intend for that to happen, but I spent four years in a software development firm figuring out how to build bespoke systems for companies at scale. Um, then I moved on into BI, Worked in a large corporate, which is another fantastic experience. You learn a lot about politics working in a large corporate. Dabbled a little bit in running my own company. Wasn't for me. Um, I couldn't separate work and life well enough. And when I realised that about myself, I thought, right, don't want to burn out. Went back into corporates. Worked in consulting for a while, which is, again, also just a really great way to add to your skill set. Like, it's not like I'd say be a consultant forever, but, and I would love love to claim that I planned all my moves. I did not. But eclectically, they've all given me different things. And what consulting really gave me was confidence with presenting and confidence with um, perhaps, how would you put it, storytelling and getting people convinced that what you have, what you have in mind, what you want to do is a reasonable thing, which is really helpful. I've always teetered back and forth between do you want to be what I call vendor side. So do you want to have someone else to have sorted out all the issues with politics of getting a big project over the line and then come in and deliver the big project, which I really, really love doing? Or, but then you're working on someone else's problem. Or do you go client side? You have to do all the politics. And you have to do all the boring. So I find boring. Business as usual work. But you get to figure out what the problem is. And so you're working on a problem that you personally think is really exciting. If you look at my CV, I've gone back and forth from one to the other. Very, very happy currently to be at SEEK where I get to do both the determination of what are the awesome problems to work on and then actually hands-on build from the ground up the algorithms that do it. And how long have you been in Australia for now? Oh, this time around, seven years, I think. I'm married to an uh, Aussie, so we go back and forth. <laughs> There you go. MIT, fascinating, because in, in the popular, and I'm a populist AI person, I'm not a scientist of any kind, so when my Twitter feed turns up with once again, what do they call it, the moral machine, which I think is an MIT-originated project around uh, can you mathematically calculate cars sure. and, the, and the way of things, and so... Uh, second time around, story didn't take it before Christmas last year. Must have been something Trumpian mm -hmm. in the news, but relaunched it and got a lot of traction this week. So, uh, the people that you wouldn't run over, James, if you were given who are the top three characters in our society that you've just programmed with brilliant machine learning a car to self drive, what are the top three 
groups of uh, humanity you don't run over? I'm guessing children are quite high on the list. It's really fascinating. Baby and stroller, number one. Young child, number two. Pregnant woman, number three. Doctor, number four. Athlete, number five. And I'm oh, look, of course, it, and, and the bad end of the deal, Kendra. Who do don't you think? Don't go there. Yeah, because um, I know what it is, and you don't want to go there. It's overweight old <laughs> criminals. Yes. <laughs> uh, run them over straight away. Uh, you would run over a criminal before you ran over a dog, and you would run over a dog, a cat before you ran over a dog. Cats lose. I mean, we know cats are on the internet. What's the conversation in those kind of things at an MIT level who've signed their name up to this kind of survey? It was a Nature mm. magazine. What's the conversation around ethics, data sets, biases, those kind of things? Is it a, is it a grown-up conversation? Oh, yeah, I find that a really, really interesting topic. So I was lucky enough, um, my company's really, really lovely. They send me every year to ICML, which is the International Conference of Machine Learning, which is one of the big academic conferences. And a couple of years ago, it was in Melbourne, I went in Sydney, I beg your pardon, I went along. It was fascinating. It was all based around a lot of image processing, a little bit of natural language processing. Wow, awesome, great fun. Went to it again this year. It was in Sweden, which was really nice. Lovely little holiday in Stockholm. But um, massive emphasis now on fair ML, which is exactly what you're speaking about. So it was so interesting to see the shift just over one year of the academic publications in one of the top conferences in the world, the increase in the concentration of people who are now super worried about what does famous even mean? Mm. And I went to a, a tutorial session the day before the conference started and uh, an economist, actually, I think he was, was giving a tutorial on the whole concept of fair ML. And he said, did you know there are 25 definitions of fairness? And that made me feel a little bit better because some of the conversations I have with my business stakeholders at SEEK are around, yes, ethics are extremely important to us. We do not want to make do anything to the job market in Australia that would be detrimental. But how do we figure out what is fair in the first place so that we can measure whether or not we are making any bad impacts apart against it. So when someone said to me, well, you know, there are 25 definitions of fairness, I said, phew, okay, it's not just me that thinks this is complicated. It's really, really It's hard. becoming an interesting conversation because Tim Miller, I remember, was talking to us about there's probably 25 definitions of explainable sure. too. And depending on the filter and mm -hmm. conscious biases and unconscious biases, you're attempting to explain how we understand even explainability to be, I've, I'm greatly forgiving uh, of someone who sounds intelligent. I'll, you, know, you can have a ratty explanation of how that decision was made, but I'm, I'm really tough on a machine. Yes, um, indeed. I want the ones and zeros to give me a very clear answer. Well, we have a very interesting – that is an interesting topic because the challenge for us, of course, is um, you can – perhaps you could build something which was very, very accurate but not what a human actually expected. And then because we will be giving that to humans, for instance, we might say to you, this would be a great job for you, James – we might be right, but if you don't believe us, you will think the AI is wrong. And on the other side, we might get, be able to tell some hires, hey, we think these people would be a great match for your job, but if for some reason we've uncovered an unconscious bias of theirs, they say, well, no, you're wrong. Your AI is terrible. I'm not going to use it again. So it's really interesting of what, what is right. Mm. I, was, I was really interested in, um, I think it was Cathy O'Neill's book, uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction, oh, and yeah. she talks about um, you know some of these job seeker um, or job, uh, sorry, candidate screening kind of algorithms mm -hmm. that have become quite popular. Um, and the example she gave, I think, is the the Moneyball example in baseball. And she said, well, the great thing about Moneyball that makes it perfect for kind of statistics is that it's a dynamic model. If, if your model suggests that this player is average and then the next year they go on to be amazing, you can look at your model and say, hmm, something was wrong, let's fix it. Whereas in the job screening kind of side of things, um, you may decide someone's average and reject them. And if they go to another company and are incredible, you've got no visibility or transparency of that. Um, and therefore, those models are kind of not dynamic or not transparent. I, I guess that's kind of a, a challenge that, that, that you guys would face and seek in terms of where do people go and how do you, how do you get feedback on a model? Yeah, it's a little. So, I agree with you. We have we you do run into that problem. Although Seek is in a really unique position there because we're not a single company, so we see everybody's hiring decisions. So one one company might decide that this person's a poor fit for them. That person might then go on be, be shortlisted for someone else. So at least we're not confounded in that way. Um, but yeah, that feedback loop is a challenge. So I guess what we're always trying to be careful of is that we are only claiming and trying to solve the problem that we can solve. 
So, for instance, the, the project that I've worked on for a couple of years and hopefully we'll, we will get out live in market quite soon is that idea of how likely are you to be a good fit for this job? Like, if you apply, how likely are you to get it? Um, what we're really careful to say, sorry, is is not how likely are you to get it, but if you apply for it, how likely are you to be asked to offer an interview? Because that's all we can do, because that's all we ever find out is are you going to get an interview? Not did you get the job? Not two years later, are you doing a fantastic role in that job? So I think some of it does come down to making sure that you're not fooling either yourself or the people who are using your AI that it's doing what it isn't doing and just being really, really clear, it's doing this. Now, human, you take over because you need to do the next bit. Yeah, and keeping that human in the loop all the Absolutely. way through. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, not only is it much, we find anyway, that it's much easier to build products where humans are part of the loop. I think it, it, it helps out with that ethical problem as well, that at least you are only suggesting to a human and then help sort of getting them to make that final decision where the ethics might really come into it. There is a world of prejudice in hiring that I think machines and algorithms can maybe start to help with, though, where if there's, you know, there's names are revealed on resumes, people have uh, unconscious biases about names, genders, nationalities, all those kind of things. Is, is there? Is, would you recommend, is there a world where an AI is going to be smart enough to actually do a better job of, of putting a candidate into a role than a human? I'm not as convinced that they are as badly biased in the aggregate as we think they are, because some people will be biased one way and some will be biased the other. Um, but it's very poorly measured, which I find interesting in that we all like to talk about it, but we're not actually going to make the effort to really deeply try and figure it out. Um, Seek has actually a product which can take away names. And what I found really interesting about that, one of our um, talent search products where people can go in and search Seek profiles, you can now have a, there's a feature which says hide the names. And so it will keep people's names out of the um, search results that you get. And what's been really gratifying for us is how many hires have said, oh, yes, please, I really want to do that. So it's an opt-in, obviously, we don't, we, you know, and you can turn it off at any time. But people are really excited by that possibility because they know that they are biased or they believe, they've read all the literature that says you have unconscious bias. When you offer them an opportunity to take that unconscious bias away, a lot of people are actually jumping at it, which is really interesting. Mm. I have a teenager as well, and I, I, you know, I'm very academic, kind of, I'm dispassionate about these things. It's all going to be fine. And then as a parent, I worry deeply that I, the struggle I see young people have to do the right degree, to get a job, and our own graduate program, I see what it takes to get a, a grad role in our place. And, you know, I, I, I feel con- consciously nervous about his future in this world where he's going into. Does your uh, three kids, mm-hmm. does, it, does it ever drive your thinking and your work? What will the next generation do? How will they possibly find jobs? I am so I don't know if you're asking how will they find jobs because it's so hard to get a toehold, or how will they find jobs because there will be no jobs. Which ones are you, are you um, talking look, about? Look, particularly, I'm interested in, in 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 thoughts around how will they find jobs when they're up against either machines mm-hmm. or biases, or will a data world help them yeah. or hinder them? Well, obviously, if they happen to fall in the group that they're biased for, it'll help them, <laughs> um, or, or humans will help them. Look, I'm not. Personally, given that I have now sat inside an organisation for a couple of years, I'm not personally too worried about machines hindering because I think I cannot foresee a future where where machines won't simply be offering up a platter of suggestions and saying, here you are, human, you make the decision. Because at the moment our hiring processes work like that, right? They get you a list of people and then you talk to them all. And as a hiring manager myself, I know how often you go from a resume that you thought was great to a candidate who, when you talked to them, was not, and sometimes vice versa. A resume that you think, yeah, I'll talk to that person because I think they'll be, you know, might be okay, and you go, wow, that was the best thing I could have done and hire them. So I think machines have a good opportunity to make that first step in the process more fair, in quotes, because they can do things like ignore your name, ignore the fact that you don't have an Australian... um, company on your resume, ignore the fact that your university is not Australian. Obviously, I'm a Kiwi, so my university degrees are not from Australia. Therefore, I'm really hopeful that you can get a more even playing field for the, here you are, human, look at these people. Beyond that, I don't really see AI changing the hiring market in the next 
10 to 20 years. I don't think humans are going to give up that bit of, I want to talk to you, I want to shake your hand, I want to be with you. And if that's where most of the bias sits, Mm. then unfortunately machines aren't going to help with that either. I've got a feeling that there might be uh, a few jobs disappear that are the traditional ladder jobs for young people along the way, whether it's, you know, the emergence of the customer service capabilities of Google's duplex and the the phone. And my, the the theatre's fantastic, you know, the, the Google Pixel phone has an assistant on it. I've watched the video. Uh, any insights as to how far that is away in Australia before we're all using Siri and chat AI to make us into these magical centaurs, half machine, half human. So I don't think Australia is going to be any different from the rest of the world in that respect, because all the companies you're talking about are global. So um, I think it's more of a question of how far are we away from that as a, I don't know, a a rich world. Um, From what I can see, and this is just me going to the conferences, where are we way off? So I still think that what you see is carefully curated. And when you see Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and Microsoft and yeah, um, Baidu doing their launches, they look really exciting, but they are still fairly limited use cases. Um, I, th- I, think I'm, I think I'm good with that. <laughs> I think I'm quite happy to live in a world in which we're, st- we're still a wee way off. And there's plenty of work for the rest of us, James, if that's the case, so <laughs> h- helping the world there. My favourite demonstration is to demonstrate in Australia what happens if we ask Siri who the best something is in a neighbourhood. And with a little bit of digging, we end up on Yelp, the restaurant review site that is biased within Siri as a major source <laughs> of who is the best mortgage broker, real estate agent, those kind of things in my world. And then it's all completely dominated by the the trolls and haters who've turned up on Yelp and left a one-star review. So uh, not enough data. That's the problem. I just find it interesting that uh, we don't have Siri, we have Google Home, but uh, she can understand my Australian kids a lot better than she can understand my, me. So there, there you go again, right? There's a lot fewer Kiwi accents in the training pool for Google and for Siri than there are Australians. So we can't activate it properly. To, to my everlasting shame, uh, appearing on television, showing our Amazon Alexa, mm-hmm. um, couldn't make it work because she thought I was asking for some kind of magical potion and elixir. Right. <laughs> there you go. I'm just coming back to the, the, the jobs and skills conversation. I think, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we're talking to businesses around AI and machine learning, and there's this perception that unless you're kind of Google or Amazon and Microsoft and you have a billion dollars to spend that, you know, AI and the skills you need are kind of out of reach. And obviously, you know, you guys here in Seeker, uh, you guys here in Australia at Seeker, are a great example that you've, you've got these tools up and running and you're solving kind of real world problems with them right now. How have you found kind of getting hold of the right skills that you need, either buying skills or training people internally? You know, how have you found that kind of talent market for, for AI and ML? Uh, I think the talent market is very competitive. But I think the flip side of it is that there are actually very few companies in Australia who are actually working in this space. So, yes, there aren't very many people who can work at the level that we need them to and do it really well. But the golden silver lining, whatever, is there's also not very many places, other places for them to go, which is quite depressing as an individual when you think to yourself, I would, I love what I do and I would love to continue to do it for 20 years. There are a lot of people advertising for data science roles, but when you dig under the covers, what they're doing is not data science. I'd love to see that change in Australia, um, but I think that we're still in a period of people haven't done the level of investment that you need to do in your data infrastructure to get to the point where they've harvested all the low-hanging fruit that they then want to put in the extra effort to get the more difficult things, if you know what I mean. I mean, if you are a business and there's lots of easy things you haven't done yet that can make you better, it is you know a no-brainer to do those things first. But many of those things don't require AI. Well, AI, they don't require machine learning and they don't require that level of skill. So... Is it hard to hire people? Yes, it's super hard to hire people. When you do get great people, though, it's reasonably easy to hang on to them because there's not a lot of great places for them to go. Um, I have some fabulous people that I work with. It is We do find it really hard to find them. We put a lot of effort into our hiring. Um, but, yeah, I don't quite agree with people who say the talent isn't out there. I think the talent is out there if you will go looking for it and you have something really good to offer. 
and that's maybe where some companies are falling down a little bit, is they think they need a PhD educated data scientist, wonder why they can't hang on to people, and it's because they're not really asking them to work at that level. I think I've heard the comment before that there's a lot of bored data scientists in Melbourne. I think that would be correct. I think there's also a lot of people calling themselves data scientists who possibly aren't, but um, yes, I don't have any bored colleagues, but I certainly have bored friends. And you shared a, you shared a, a great article on, on Medium that you wrote around the approach you've taken at Seek to um, get the software engineering community kind of up to speed on machine learning pipelines. And um, so it sounds like there's been a you know a combination of recruiting talent, but also kind of growing talent internally. Um, do you think there's kind of career pathways where people can get more? competent in machine learning technologies that, you know, that point you made before, you don't need to be a PhD researcher. There are plenty of people in the building who have the skills today, they just need a bit of training. Yes, I think it's really careful, and we, we always try to be very careful like this when we're hiring, is to differentiate between um, sort of the different sort of things, roles that there are. So we're always really super clear with people, particularly people coming out of academia. We seek are not an R&D shop. You're not going to be publishing if you come work for us. You know, you're not going to be working on the next incre- increment of the next new algorithm. We're taking algorithms that have been developed, some of them only in the last couple of years, mostly out of places like Google and, you know, the top universities, although most of the top universities have all gone to Google now. We're taking those algorithms that were published a couple of years ago and we're implementing them. We're not R&D. Don't come to work for us if that's what you want to do. Then there's cool, we've got these algorithms working, now we need to make them work at scale. That is a different skill set, and that's what we were really focusing on at Seek when we were doing our course for our engineers. There's a whole lot of people who are fascinated by machine learning, because it's a really cool thing, right? It's, It's really, really exciting. But what they find most fulfilling is actually getting the algorithms to work at scale. There's a lot of faffing around, right, when you're actually building a machine learning algorithm, because so much of it is figuring out, do you have the data? What on earth does the data actually mean? And how do you then go in and fill in all the gotchas and all the holes and all the missing bits in the data? Lots of people find that excruciatingly boring and would rather say, great, you figured all that out, now let me make that work at scale. And that's really what we were focusing on at Seek, was how do we take all our really talented engineers who build things at scale, super fast and super accurate and super um, resilient for a living, and just help them learn enough about ML that they can then become really, really competent engineers who work alongside machine learning. So, for instance, they might well, in their future careers, go on to, for instance, say, um, hey, I want to classify these car photos because I'm, you know, some company doing secondhand cars. Rather than build my own image recognition, I can now go use Google's API or use Microsoft's API. I know enough about how it works and enough about the cycle of machine learning doesn't matter that I can't build the algorithm myself. And for Seek anyway, that's where we see a real scalability is people being able to tap into the services, people understanding the services to the extent that they need to to make them work and to capture the data that will feed them and to make sure that they're working um, within parameters. You need far more of those people than you need of the people who sweat out the tiny little details of the data and build the models in the first place. My rule of thumb, and I haven't been disproven yet, is that for one, every one actually good seriously dedicated data scientist you have, to fully utilise that person, you need four engineers. And that's what we were doing at Seek, was really trying to get as many of our engineers who were interested up to speed with how do you know enough about ML to be um, a sort of an ML-aware engineer and to really take those products and make them fly because I certainly am not a good enough coder to get all of my products out into the wild. I think it was Cassie Cosgrave from from Google who kind of talked about the and made the analogy of... Um, you know, a cooking analogy, made, you know, the analogy being that, um, you know, if the data scientist is kind of selecting the dish, you don't actually need to know how an oven works. You just need to choose the right appliance. And the engineer in that sense could be kind of building an algori- the algorithm, which in this sense could be the appliance. Yeah. And kind of breaking that view of there's research, which is building better ovens, and then there's applied machine learning, which is making great food in that kind of analogy. Yeah, I, I found that, I, I, know, I know the talk you're talking about, and I found it really interesting. I think it's ever so slightly different, though. So I think what she was talking about is, 
let's she was talking about frameworks she was talking about um you know nobody else needs to go and recreate spark because that's been done no one else needs to go and recreate tensorflow although hey facebook decided to do it anyway with pytorch because they've been done we all as little companies around the world do not need to hire someone with the skills to build the next pytorch and it's a good thing because it's probably only five people in the world who can so I would view myself in that, I guess, as a chef. Like, I'm sure as heck not figuring out how to build the microwave oven, but I'm probably designing the menu. What we're keen to get, I guess, with our engineers is a a lot of people, this sounds very patronising and I don't mean it to, who can be short-order cooks. They're not designing the menu, they're not having to figure out what ingredients to put in, but my goodness, they can make it absolutely hum at speed and they can make them run all the time with incredible robustness and resilience. Yeah, and getting that feedback loop short, getting kind of quick responses to, to is this model doing or is this this outcome what we expected it to be? Yeah, and for us, I mean, our, and I'm sure many other companies around Australia, our systems are so complicated that it's much easier for me to sit down and explain, you know, have a chat with 30 engineers about, hey, this is the kind of data you're going to need to collect to get those feedback loops working. And for them to turn around and go, oh, Oh, Kendra, I think that means we're going to want to capture X, Y, Z and double and did you and did you know that if we don't do this, that won't happen and then it is for me to try to understand every single one of the complex systems that they've built. So that's what we're trying to hit is that idea where everyone gets enough of an understanding of what ML needs to be fed and watered, if you might put it like that, so that they then turn around and go, oh, right, now I know how to do my part of the job in a way that is going to be really synergistic with that little piece of the job that you guys kind of pop in the top. And I think you, you talked about kind of being at the, the edge of all the boundary between kind of software engineering and, and machine learning, and it, it sounds like that's kind of what you're referring to when you when you made that when you when you say that, which is if you don't have that combination of machine learning and that software engineering together with the right kind of balance of people, you're never going to get the right outcome at scale. I firmly believe that. So I've I've, I've as we mentioned, been through a number of companies in the last you know sort of ten years, and each one has has been building towards that thing of. Neither in isolation is going to do it. And it's a situation we've got really lovely at Seek at the moment. We, about eight, ten months ago, really said, right, we're biting this bullet and we're going to make cross-functional teams. There's going to be no more throwing over the fence from machine learning to engineering. We're going to get people who sit together, work together, live and breathe what they do together. But they're going. To, we know there are going to be specialists, so we're not pursuing that agile dream of every single person in the team could pick up any piece of the ticket because it's... At least I've never met a team like that. But we're going to to allow these people to work closely enough together that they are building products together. And it works fantastically well. It's funny you mention that because I was reflecting with someone the other day that we kind of we often seem to forget um, our learnings from from history because Nigel has taught me more about agile than and cross functional, you know, teams than 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 anyone else in my career, I think. Um, and going into an organization and seeing them have product, you know, digital teams that are multidisciplinary, cross functional and getting great outcomes. And then you walk around the corner to the data team and you've got the mm-hmm. engineering data engineers up here and the data scientists in another building. And it's almost like we've forgotten the last decade of or more of progress when we've in a new domain like like data. I think it is funny how we don't take those learnings with us, isn't it? Because it's um it's like I went worked in banking for a long time, and it always astounded me how um, digital was still its own area. It's like the customers don't view it like that. Why, why do we as banks still have this digital team over here rather than integrating that into the mortgage team and the credit cards team? And I think it's super important and really true. A lot of teams still go, yes, we're totally integrated. We've got totally cross-functional. Oh, you want to talk to the data scientists? Oh, they sit over there. <laughs> go talk to them. They're a bit scary. Um, and when Seek really broke that mould and said, no, this is a, a general part of our business now. We're going to put them in all the teams and we're going to work really closely together. It's made a phenomenal difference to, to the scale of products we can deliver. James, James, philosophy questions. I'm dying here. There's too much science and mathematics going on. Over to you. So, uh, look, I'm really curious about your... It's like a statement that comes up. It's on your Twitter profile. It's in various places. Never die wondering. So I'm, I'm, I'm dead curious about where, where, where did that come from? Was that the child growing up in New Zealand? Was that something you've picked up along the way? Are you, is your curiosity your strongest point? That's a, I mean, it's a very strong phrase. What, what does it uh, mean yeah, to so, you? No, it's a really good question. And I have to say that never die wondering is a little bit of a talisman for me, actually. So um, I've, I have changed 
careers as many times, I think, as they now predict most millennials will. So it's still unusual in, in my generation to have changed careers as often as I have done. Um, and I think because of that, I've been exposed to situations where I've thought, I'm, I'm super scared. I don't have the information I need to make this decision. And so for a number of times in my career when I've been faced with, for instance, do I leave academia? Massive commitment that I had made to it but I didn't think I would be happy there, do I leave academia? Or in one um, other instance of my career, do I take my three children under the age of five and move to Malaysia? <laughs> um, having moved back to this, from the States to be closer to family, do I now make that move and go to Malaysia? And in the absence of enough information to make the decision completely rationally, I use, this, use that, re that rubric, never die wondering. And so I've basically said, I know what my life will look like if I stay in this realm. I don't know what it will look like if I do that. I don't want to die wondering. It's, a mar it's, it's an algorithm. <laughs> there you go. It's my own decision tree. That if there's unsatisfied mystery curiosity down a particular path, you'll take that path. I will. And I, it's worked out pretty well for me to date, not because it's all been successful choices, but because I, I'm not going to die wondering. I'm going to know. Marvellous philosophy. Can I go back to one of my dull questions? or Let's go back to the science, James. Okay. Um, I'm just intrigued about the comment you made before and with that discussion we had around, um, you know, lots of board data scientists and people being recruited to do a certain thing, but then maybe not, not kind of getting to do what they've been hired for. Um, it, what kind of, I mean, you, you seek a pretty far ahead of the curve, I think it's fair to say, can, compared to most organisations in Australia around machine learning adoption and usage. Um, for organisations that are kind of the other end of the spectrum that are perhaps getting started, they're being inundated with Harvard Business Review articles and, and hype. Uh, what kind of practical advice would you give an organisation that's just getting started with machine learning? So if I was a business owner, I would take a serious look at what is it that I actually think it's going to bring? So I do still see a lot of companies in Australia advertising for data scientists because, like you said, they've read Forbes on the way back from the junket in San Francisco and they've said, hey, everyone's got this AI shit, we need that stuff. Have a really close look at it and figure out whether you actually need it because if you're going to do it well, it is a massive investment. If you have decided that, yes, you truly do, so you can see some use cases in your business that if you use the Andrew Ng rule of thumb, um, if you could do it, a human could do it in less than a minute, that sort of thing. If you ask five people, they tell you the same process. Yep, those can possibly be automated, although there's a big difference between robotic process automation and machine learning, which a lot of Australian companies seem to get wrong. But if you've sort of done your navel gazing and figured that out, it's a slightly tricky one because if you hire your data scientists first, they will get bored. But if you do a lot of investment in your data infrastructure before you hire your data scientists, you do run the risk of instrumenting for the wrong data. So what I see is that companies want to do AI, but they haven't yet or don't have an appetite for the level of investment in data infrastructure that they need. Um, so I would say figure out whether you really have the appetite for it and then maybe hire yourself a couple of really senior people and that's really hard because if you don't have any, how on earth do you figure out whether the person you're talking to is good or whether they're just really good at making you think they're good? And then expect to spend two to five years investing in building really, really high-class data capture infrastructure before you really expect to start building a lot of machine learning. And I don't think companies want to hear that because they want to say, we can hire ourselves a couple of data scientists and roll out some beautiful algorithms. But my experience is you can't, and you're better off biting that bullet first and saying, if we're getting into this, we're getting into it for the long haul. And I suppose that doesn't quite align with the traditional corporate ROI metrics and capital allocation process either, right? Absolutely. But then you turn it around and you say, but look at the companies that are fantastically good at this. They are companies in the large part that are run by technologists. And, you know, Amazon has made a very sizable business based on reselling all of the data infrastructure that they built for their own business to the rest of the world. The level, I think that people really underestimate the level of investment that the big fan companies have put into instrumentation. And they go, wow, Google does all the stuff they have. What do they say? They have 5,000 deep learning models running in production. 
You're like, yep. And they also spend billions of dollars on data engineers who keep that all running and collect all the instrument and instrument all the data that that flows through those models. And I, I don't see the appetite for that level of data investment in a lot of Australian companies. Well, that's a dear, serious takedown of the banking industry in Australia for you right there. But that has always fascinated me because if you think of behavioural data in large quantities, the bank statement of the 1990s is proactively linking the world of human behaviour of buying things. It all lies in the banks. Our banks have amazing data. And I mean, obviously, I worked in the FI for a long time. And why? Because I find banking data really, really interesting. I mean, banking data, telco data, and Seek's data. Yep, that's what I've done, banking, telcos, and Seek, um, because the data sets are amazing. And massive questions like risk, where there's huge gains to be made. Oh, for sure. But remember, those are really heavily ML. So there are pockets of the FI industry that are already really heavily run with machine learning. Very, very well regulated machine learning, of course, in the case of risk. But that's a high margin industry. So I think that's why there's a possibly a, a level of investment that it makes sense for Australian FI to get into and a level at which you start to more see the... Um, what do they call them? The FI, the over-the-top companies coming in, where it's, oh, it's worth fintech. it for them. The fintech. There you go. I think there's a lot of investment in ML in fintech, not quite so much perhaps in the classical, traditional banking industries because they don't need it. I don't think any of them made less than $6 billion last year, so that suggests your thesis is pretty good, actually. And yeah, it will be interesting with open banking and obviously what we're seeing with open banking in Europe and now coming here as to what that will do to jolt, I guess, the, the, big, the big banks into action and also... I haven't actually caught up on that lately. What's happening? What's the next step with open banking? There was much promise and fear, but we had to get through the Banking Commission. Are we seriously looking at banking data being transparent sometime? Yeah. So there is, um, there is I think, uh, probably a better question for our first guest, Alan Broad, who I think is uh, involved in that now with Data61. But yeah, there is a, a whole range of standards which the, the big four have to apply, have to adhere to first. Um, probably a topic to get a, a, someone to come and talk to us about, actually, because yeah. uh, it'd be good to go a little bit deeper on that. Well, I mean, I think um, one of the smarter people at our place said that we don't have a big data problem, we have a wide data problem. We just we just don't have longitudinal data of the style that would interest too many PhDs yet, and we have a, we have a smallish team in our place. I think that's probably an Australian dilemma. Um, the other dilemma I think our industry has in, is that we don't own all the data and we haven't done the Chinese thing of the fully integrated right to the online to offline to the consumer and the complexity of, of licensing and buying that data off all of the people who own it to get a picture, a simple picture of a consumer. Particularly Australian problem, I suspect. Hmm. I want to go back to the ethics, uh, some of the ethics conversation um, just for a little bit and well, I think we were reflecting on a previous episode around um, that you think AI, and again, you think Facebook, Netflix, you think the big tech companies. And I think we've seen in um, books like Cathy O'Neill's book and also um, I think Automating Inequality, which I've recently got through, which was a, uh, a very interesting read, just, just highlighted the level of usage of kind of automated decisioning in, in government institutions, especially in the U.S., um, and I think we kind of hear this, well, it's not going to happen here. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it won't happen in Australia, which might be might be true, might might not be true. Um, you know, is this a conversation that comes up a lot at Seek in terms of you guys are at the cutting edge? Should you be, are you, you know, helping to shape the conversation in Australia and ensure that people are thinking about the impacts of these just beyond the four walls of Seek? Uh, yeah, so... so Seek is a company that is incredibly um, centred still around the reason it was founded, which is, and, and our mission statement, which I'm going to get slightly wrong, but which is essentially to help people find their dream jobs. So um, we're still run by the gentleman who founded us 20 years ago, and this, the culture of Seek has always been focused on doing the right thing, not the easy thing, not the quick thing, et cetera, et cetera. And we're really lucky um, in that. You, you sort of, I, I noticed that as an employee, that we are driven by not, will this make money, but is this the right thing to do sustainably for the Australian job market? And on that topic, I mean, um, we had Dr. Alan Finkel propose this idea of a Turing certificate, which is, you know, effectively like a standards, a set of standards around, uh, you know, for people working on machine learning and, uh, and AI. Um, 
obviously got a lot of interest, got picked up by the World Economic Forum. Um, you a supporter of something like that? Do you think it's it's uh, it's needed here? I'm certainly a supporter of having much more discussions about ethics and AI. The Turing, it seemed to me a little too opt-in. So it was, as I understood it, it was still, um, it was almost like a, you know, you can put this food labelling on if you want to put the food labelling on. Um, I'd like to believe that our society would reward companies for that good citizenship. I'm not sure that's reflected in actual fact in the companies that we see being successful in Australia. So I guess I would say I'm a supporter of the concept, but I'm not sure that it's enough. I'm not sure that it takes us far enough. And it's actually one of the reasons I'm really interested in the, um, it's called FAT ML, Fairness, mm. Accountability and Transparency, yeah. Um, one thing I really like about those conversations, and I'd love to see um, even some of our Australian universities really picking up on that, is it's that we need to bring more people into the conversation and a diverse group of people into the conversation. And I'm sure you had this conversation with some of your previous guests, but I'm not an ethicist. And I don't have that training, and neither do most of my colleagues who are software engineers and physicists and, you know, biologists and maybe the occasional psychologist. But how do we find places to bring in lawyers and ethicists and people who study the arts and maybe thought a bit harder, or maybe some historians who've said, hey, humanity tried this a while ago, it didn't work so well, let's not do it again. That's something I'd be really, really interested in Australia trying to lead. As, and I know that the Human Rights Commission is already looking at it and there were some conversations about it over the last six months, but how do we push on that a little harder rather mm. than just relying on good corporate citizenship, I guess? Yeah, OK. So we put a few guests in the past on the spot over Australia's state of uh, data and um, so national health record in or out, prepared to say? Me personally? Yeah. I'm afraid I'm out. So that makes me very curious. So what was your thought process? What was the algorithm that got you to out? What you're going to find even funnier is that I actually was in, because I was part of the trial group, and I pulled out. Um, so why was I in the trial group? Because I thought it was a great idea. I was in the trial, so were all three of my children, um, because I've moved countries a lot. So I personally suffer from this problem, right, is that if I actually had a major health problem, I'd have to go to four different countries and try and beg for my medical records from all the doctors. So I was initially in because I think it's a fantastic idea. Love the idea of integrated health information. I pulled out because one of my teenage sons actually said to me, you've got to be kidding. We're not in that, are we? And he had been reading a lot of the media releases. And when I sat down and did that, I was concerned that there there only has to be one breach and that we hadn't done our due diligence as a country to make sure that there wouldn't be that one breach. Mm. So I love it in principle, <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm a bit nervous. Mm. Well, that's consistent so far. James, the professionals are telling us, yep. out, we've got till mid-November. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, it's been pretty unanimous so far, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. You've got yeah. to the November if you can get through on the telephone, is my understanding. Uh, maybe they need a chatbot, James. I think it's a good, very good point. Um, uh, last question for me, I, I think just, um, uh, you obviously have got a pretty vibrant machine learning community now in Australia, lots of events, lots of meetups, lots of publications. Um, what, what, do you, what does your team get involved in? What are the kind of the go-to groups that, that your team rely on to kind of keep their knowledge and skills contemporary? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we are super lucky in Melbourne in particular, actually. Sorry, the rest of Australia, but I think Melbourne's got a couple of like really standout groups. So um, m most of my team and the people that work with around me are really, really interested in meetups. We participate in a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. The Melbourne Data Science one is great. Go there a lot. Um, the MLAI, the Wet Brains Meetup, find that really, really great. There's a new natural language processing meetup just started. Obviously, that's tailor made for us. So a lot of us go to that. That's mostly the meetups I think that people are really interested in. Um, in terms of other stuff, I think a lot of it's outside Australia. So that is, you know, the wonderful thing about the internet. We don't have to be constrained by the by the uh, globe. I read a lot off O'Reilly, so lucky for me, my husband and I both do similar things, so we just bit the bullet about five years ago and went, oh, 300 bucks a year, that's a lot of money, but hey, we buy that in books if we don't have it. So we have an O'Reilly subscription, and I reckon uh, we both use that really, really heavily. Um, and just blogs. There are so many really interesting bloggers in the space. Um, I don't use Twitter, actually, haven't for years. Um but I think one of my colleagues does, and he becomes almost my personalised Twitter feed. 
don't know how he does that much reading, but um, keeping up with him, keeping up with the um, with Andrew Ng, yeah, um, that, that pretty much covers it. And go to conference globally. What do you think's the What's your, your standout one on the calendar each year? Yeah, so like I said, the last two years I've been to ICML, which is fantastic. So I don't really go to industry conferences. I don't, they're not, for me, I haven't found them worth the investment of time, and it really is time more than money. Um, I do listen to a lot of the Strata Conf and the AI Conf that comes through, again, the O'Reilly subscriptions, where you get all of the full streaming about a week delayed. I do listen to those. I wouldn't go to them because I, I would say I listen to five or six talks out of a three-day uh, three day um, meeting. But ICML, absolutely fantastic, really loved it. Would really like to get to NIPS and might manage that next year. But also um, ACL was in Melbourne this year, so uh, Computational Association of Computational Linguistics. And I managed to make it for one day because, unfortunately, I had to get back from Stockholm. Um, and I only managed to make its tutorials, but it was fantastic. Obviously, for us, incredibly focused on natural language processing, and that is the bread and butter of what SEEK does, so very specific. Um, so I'd love to get back to that next year. And Fatimel, have you been to any of their events? I have not, no. Yeah, it's one we've been talking about a lot internally. As a, Excellent, I'll add to get it to my to. list. Mm. And if I could wave a magic wand and grant you an extra 10 hours a week of Ooh. perfectly productive time, Ooh. but the, the trade-off is you have to write a book. What's the book going to be on? What's absolutely the field that's got your curiosity you'd like to spend research time on and and not die wondering what a book on X would be? Oh, that is a very difficult question. I think it would be human productivity. Oh. And I'm not sure how I define exactly what that is. But, yeah, if I could have 10 hours of perfectly productive time, to be honest, it wouldn't be anything I do now. It would be something completely different. And I think it would be into how can we help people learn better, sort of, yeah, is there, are there, I mean, maybe there are AI interfaces to enrich that, but not for me, the AI side of things, just how could we harness more of human potential? I think that's what I would do. I don't know what the book would be called, but I would love that. So please get that magic wand ready. James, I'd buy that book. I would definitely buy that book. Yep. Awesome. Kendra, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great talking to you. Very much appreciate your time. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And great to meet another amazing Kiwi. Absolutely. They're everywhere. (laughs) Thanks for joining us on AI Australia. We hope you got a lot out of it. If you enjoyed the show, feel free to leave us a review on iTunes by searching for AI Australia and giving us your honest feedback. It goes a long way to boost our visibility when you do that, so we really appreciate it. As always, we'd love to hear from you. To get in touch, head to eliza.com.au forward slash contact and drop us a note. Thanks again and look forward to seeing you next week.